Welcome to the Infinity Rewatch podcast. Um, but of course, like most podcasts, we also like to put this on YouTube so you can watch a video version of it. For those of you who do watch it, you're in for a treat today. Because let me just say, for a man who always just looks perpetually handsome, Ryan, your hair is like flawless today. I don't know what's going on, oh, but you. you look like a like a like a toy of just a handsome man. Like if somebody was like, let's make an action figure. Okay, what's this character? <laughs> it doesn't matter about the character, he just has to be a handsome man. That's what it would look like how you're presented to me right now. Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, I will say, guys, a fun gift you can do for your friends. If you find an action figure that resembles a friend of yours, ask Fantasia to write a character biography about that person and then take that biography and print it and then put it on the toy and then take a picture of your friend and put that on the toy. Yes. And then if it's a talking <laughs> toy, record your friend saying like five random lines and yeah. then put a little <laughs> microchip in the toy. Boom. You've got like a personalized Buzz Lightyear. There you go. 100%. I, I think that's the best way to do it. But uh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, you look great as ever. You know, I love your beard, man. The beard. I, thank it's you. It's been such a journey for you and your beard, but it's just, I, I can't see you without it now. I know. I mean, it, it's funny because I'm watching, you know, I'm looking back at my old footage of, I have my, my James Bond uh, retrospective going on right now on my YouTube channel as I'm counting down to no time to die. And these early videos in the retrospective were made in January, 2020, back when I thought the movie was going to come out soon before the delay happened. And you can see the early beard because it's January, 2020. And you can see yeah. how, you know, it has morphed into a thing unto itself. And now I'm pretty sure it's going to have its own Marvel movie because it's just taken on a life of its own at this point. <laughs> that's awesome all right well we're here we're here for another episode of what if what if i, what? I, I would love to say it as like genuinely as jeffrey does but i can't he has such a, like a <sighs> soft lovely voice but it's still so earthy you know like it, it there there's a i feel like there's a right and a wrong way to say what if when you're the character of the watcher, like to say like, join me as we ponder the question. Uh, there's a right or wrong way that he could have said it and he found the right way to say it. Jeffrey Wright is, there's a reason his name is not Jeffrey Wrong. Let's put it that yeah. way. He is a talented man. Um, yeah, I, sure. I don't know if you've, over the years, if you picked up any Spanish from Isabella, but uh, do you know how to say what if in Spanish? I do, but uh, but Isabella doesn't speak Spanish. That's she right. She Portuguese. speaks Portuguese. She does. <laughs> I've heard her. I've heard her swear. I've mostly heard her swear. And since it's so similar between Spanish and Portuguese, when it, when the swearing comes into play, I always automatically go to Spanish. But do you know how to say "what if" in Portuguese? I don't actually, but I know how to say it in Spanish. <laughs> well, now we're just talking in circles. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Uh, but that's what was funny about it. <laughs> oh man! Uh, huh. Anyway, uh, so and the reason why I know is because my uncle Dave, very cool uncle of mine, he's like very trendy with the fashion and all that stuff. Um, he would say he he's the one who called me RJ. That's where the nickname came from, RJ. Uh, those of you who don't know my my family my close friends and family call me RJ. It's just a cool way of doing it. Um, but he would come up to me and be like, "Yo, RJ, qué pasa?" And that's the Spanish phrase for "what's up," as far as far as I know. For what's up? Okay. Qué pasa? Qué pasa? So what if might be like K dot 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 upside down exclamation mark? <laughs> qué? <laughs> qué? <laughs> Uh, if anybody is a Spanish speaker out there and you're listening, tell us how you would say <laughs> what if. Uh, I'm trying to think of how we say it in Maltese, and I don't know. Maltese is weird. I don't know what the proper word for it is. It's probably something outrageous. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of outrageous, Killmonger. Yes. That guy's a big meanie. <laughs> so meanie. No matter oh, what man. multiverse you're in, he's still a meanie who cuts his chest 
and just murders folks. Yeah, yeah. I okay. All right. I <laughs> I was gonna try to try to follow our formula here, but like walking through the episode, but I'm just gonna go all over the radar on this one. <laughs> um, I like that they're bringing back villains uh, in What If because it's good to see these villains again. Um, Killmonger, really cool, really awesome. I liked I liked the randomness of this episode. Like, hey, what if Killmonger was where Tony was and he saved him in this whole nine yards? Um, and I like seeing Ulysses Claw again because he is an incredible villain who did not need to die in the MCU. But in order to propel the story forward, he needed to die, which is unfortunate. Um, but I really like him, and I really like Andy Serkis as a character as a as a character actor, and it's it's incredible. So here's the thing. What I what I don't like about this episode is and Isabella was right, and and I I wish I could quote her verbatim here, but she's not around right now. She's downstairs. Um, uh, she she was saying the problem with this episode, and I wholeheartedly agree, is that it I feel like this episode kind of ruins the impact that Killmonger had as a as a villain in the original hmm. okay it, it kind of in my in my words it kind of neuters him a little bit because like here's the thing right like the big thing about black panther is they all celebrated killmonger because of 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 his goals right he was kind of like he, he kind of realized that he what he needed to do in order to you know um he or sorry, let me rephrase it. He was right. In the end, he was right as a villain. Like he he was he was right about his perspective. Yeah. Now, did he take it too far? Probably. He mm -hmm. probably took it a little too far. But it doesn't mean he wasn't right. He was very much right about like, you know, need to split the resources. You gotta give, you know, we gotta support our people and all this stuff. And that's what made the conflict between Black Panther and Killmonger so good and and for Black Panther to learn from that was amazing and then in this episode they kind of just like made him way too evil like the, to a point where it's not even like he was right anymore it's just like man he was so bad like he's just such an evil person and like he's like he's just like using power it's it's I think it's the question not the question is not what if in this one it's like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely right and that's like what it came down to and the sh the, sh the episode was great but i feel like it really took away some stuff from killmonger like you know what i mean it really took away the core of what killmonger was all about huh see now i i found that to me he was consistent with the movie killmonger he was, really? he was, I felt he, he was the same level of evil. I think the only difference for, for with what, uh, what if did here is that what if didn't take the time to show what happened to his father and for him to kind of talk about that and how that shaped him, because that is, you're right. That's the, the humanizing part of Killmonger. That's what makes him right. Is that yeah. T'Chaka did a bad thing once upon a time. And it led to this boy having a, just a shitty life. Um, so we see that that created this monster and it gives the monster a little bit of clarity. Whereas here, that same event created the same monster. We just don't talk about the event. So I, I felt like it was the same guy because I feel like both in the movie and here, I'm like, I hate this dude. He's so mean. Uh, and he... He just kills anybody, not even, I can't even say anybody in his way, because even people who aren't in his way, he's just ready to kill willy-nilly. Like, in the movie, when he gets to the throne room and he sits on the throne, I feel like even though now he has what he wants, I feel like all those other people, those elders who who sit by the throne, I feel like he could not care less whether they lived or died. Yeah. Like, if one of them sneezed in a way he didn't like, I feel like he would have just been like, guards shoot him. Mm -hmm. Uh he just comes across as a monster, yes, 
a monster who has been created by some unfortunate circumstances and you know he's very hurt by what his past was like but i found that this was the same monster in this one at least for me he felt like the same guy he was just being a douche to different people essentially i think i think we're going to be at odds on this one because because the the thing with me is i get i get the backstory is there because of our knowledge of the character mm-hmm. from the mcu and and it and and what if doesn't spend that time because it doesn't need to right like we get we know his story and in this one it's it's saying like okay but if he saved tony stark tony stark would have been the instrument to like help him you know get to where he needs to get to and in the end he still ends up the same place but the issue I have here is, is that's not my issue. I, I, the humanizing part's still there. And the issue I have is, is like, he kind of just becomes like, I, it's, it's kind of like, I'm going to do this so I can take over the world. Whereas where opposed to, I'm going to do this because we should be sharing Wakanda tech to, to, you know, to, to our people. We need to share that technology so they can, you know, they could be the, the equalizer and we can, you know, make change. That's what, that's what he was fighting for. And this one, it just seems like that was not even a part of the conversation. It's just like, I'm going to take over Wakanda and then take over the world. Like, it just was that kind of like, it was kind of that classic Disney villain where it's just like, you know, just taking it so far and just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make giant robots. And then I'm going to, I'm going to conquer. I'm going to, I'm going to convince the U S that Wakanda is bad. And I'm going to convince Wakanda that the U S is bad. And then I'm going to make them all fight. And then I'm going to be the last one standing. (laughs) (laughs) Like, it's just, it, uh, that's why I feel like it kind of hurt his story a little bit, like his character. I, I think, I mean, in the end it was kind of, again, the concept of the, the the story is a cool idea. Yes, what if Killmonger was there and he met Tony and Tony would have never gotten out of the weapons industry it would have been a totally different story. But in the end, the problem I have is like my last memory of Killmonger in Black Panther, he was like, yeah, he was he was he was fighting for a cause and it was it was fight these two people fighting for a cause and they're they're both right in a way. And for them to, yeah, for them to kind of revisit the character and then do this story, it's kind of like, no, no, he was really bad. He was a bad, bad <laughs> person. Like, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I could be like, again, I might not be seeing the whole picture here, but this show, I don't know. This show is, is, is I don't know. It's weird for me. It's, it's a weird show. It is a tricky show. Um, I Do you think, I'm trying to remember, in the movie, what is his reasoning behind burning all the purple flowers? Is it just like, because I'm the only one who gets to have this power? Because I think he wanted to end that tradition. He wanted to end traditions because tradition was the problem. And again, I, 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 I'm going in here with half my memory of, of Black Panther here. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I need to refresh it a little bit, but but my understanding was he wanted to get rid of tradition because that was the problem. And because he was still part of that last experience, it's like, okay, I'll just live with it, whatever. But it's just like, he wanted to get rid of tradition because that was the problem. And, you know, Wakanda is sitting on this amazing metropolis of technology and opportunity and all this stuff. And they're just keeping it to themselves. And that's a problem. And it's like, no, we need to, we need to give all of our people equal opportunity and resources they need to to better themselves and to make change. Now, but the problem is, I think he was obviously giving all he was obviously giving all these resources and potential weapons and stuff to things that might go into the wrong hands, and that's kind of the gray area of where his issue is. But in the end, his ideology was like we need to give our people the the means and the tools to create real change. Okay. So if, if that's the case, if that's really why he burned the flowers, I think I can get behind the idea that he's worse here. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I always saw it as he burned the flowers because it was like, he's going to gonna me, be the last, 
Yeah. Yeah. To me, the movie Killmonger is because he experienced that trauma as a little boy. To me, he's still stuck as that little boy. Mm -hmm. And burning the flowers was the little kid saying, if I can't play with the toys, nobody can. And, and, you know, just being like petty about it. It was petty. It came from a place of pettiness. Right. Um, That was the way I interpreted it at least. But if, if it is what you say, if it is about trying to change Wakanda for the, for the better and trying to just make it completely different Wakanda. Right. Then, then I think I can get behind the idea that, he's worse here because right. the killmonger of this episode would have burned the flowers for pettiness. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. And, and that, that that's exactly it. Right. You see what I mean? Like it's the way they structured this. What if episode is they, they, it, that, that point right there, that's the reason. And again, like, I, I don't know. I feel like what if the show, what if is being pretty tame? I it, it's, as much as it, it's offering cool ideas, like for example, one of my, one of my big moments in here is like is like Killmonger's like, oh yeah, you know, I I you know one one way I was gonna make change is I'm gonna use these giant robots to fight in battle so people don't die. Like that was that was an interesting part to me because it's like okay, there's that Killmonger we know because like he has he has a good reason why he wants these mechs in there. But to me, the problem, and I love that they dropped Gundam, by the way, for you anime fans out there. We heard the word Gundam. <laughs> but for me, uh, overall, it still felt tame. Uh, it still felt like a tame episode. Like, it was very much like Iron Man 2. Essentially, it was Iron Man 1 and 2, but it was Killmonger in, in replacing Obadiah Stained and Justin Hammer, all in all in one character. And right. it's... It, it again it just and again it didn't work it didn't work for me i this show i again i i just want them to go introduce like characters that we could see or could not see like we've we've i've been we've been kind of doing this cycle for a couple episodes now but i'll, I'll keep it short is like again like there's more opportunity here to introduce characters from the comics and you can cast them whichever way you like and then recast them in the movies because because if or if a certain popularity happens, you can put an actor from the show into the movies. Like it could be a whole thing. But to me, like to me, that episode was thirty minutes of what if Killmonger replaced Obadiah Stained and Justin Hammer, and they redid those two movies in thirty minutes or less. Yeah, yeah, it's not a very um, poignant branch, is right. it? It's not. Uh... You know, the greatest what if questions are forks in the road that take you down completely divergent paths. And this was a path that was so close, you could almost really just cross the street and you're back on the normal MCU canon path. Yeah. So it it, it was something that was, it just kind of, I guess, felt more like a way to get characters in the same room who have never been in the same room, like Killmonger and Happy. Uh, I, I guess it was just one of those weird kinds of things to see that happen. But yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't think many people would put this in their favorite list in terms of the episodes of this show, because it really is, uh, it, it feels like mid season filler, which mm-hmm. it very well may end up being. Um, exactly. I, I, I think there there's was more a mid-season trailer. There was a mid-season trailer, but on purpose, I did not watch it because mm-hmm. I'm trying to see. I'm going to try to see by playing it smart, not watching the trailer, and then seeing what happens in the show. Now, you guys in the you guys could say, "Oh, in the trailer, you know, this could happen, this could happen, and so, all this stuff." Great. I want to see if I will be surprised by not watching the trailer and having those moments, but. But yeah, no, man. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to go down a negative tone with "What If" too much. I think again, I, what I'm trying to say here is, I like it. It's got purpose, but I just feel like they're playing it really safe. The Doctor Strange one was really cool, but it still felt like Doctor Strange 1.5. Like you know what I mean? Like as like little mm-hmm. extra scenes of what happened with Doctor Strange playing with his little amulet. Like you know what I mean? Like you know, as opposed to the ending of like he you know, 
Wong putting it back or watching him put it back on the thing. It's like, hey, yeah, you still got a lot to learn. But like <laughs> in this case, he's like, nope, I'm really good at this. And then, you know, I'm going to fix everything. And, and what if Christine died? Uh, and and to me, I think the biggest, I think the biggest what if episodes that have done really well thus far are the Captain Carter one because that one is again it introduces a new character and it goes in a very different direction. Um, and I actually have to say, in in terms of comparisons right now, the zombies one actually is is pretty good in comparison because it's just such a different event. Yes. Um, the the Hank the the Hank Pym murdering the Avengers one is also another good one, but it's still forgettable in my opinion, just because it's 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 just like again, it's it still plays within it still plays kind of tame in my opinion like it's just it's i don't know to me it's just forgettable it's like hank pym just gets angry and starts killing people like that's really all it is you know what i mean like it doesn't really offer substance that's the word i'm looking for it doesn't offer substance it offers a lot of entertainment but it doesn't offer a lot of substance um uh so so yeah so for me right now the zombies one and the captain carter one really stands out because it does feel different and it does it does offer a unique experience but the other ones so far uh even the black panther one was was something different as well um but again it's still it still felt like it still felt like guardians you know what i mean like it still it still felt like guardians even though black you know chadwick boseman bless his heart came in there and and convinced thanos like hey man mass genocide doesn't work but in the end, it still felt like a Guardians movie because we saw the collector, these events mm-hmm. happened, and bada bing, bada boom. Yeah, I think I had the exact same thought when this last episode ended that you just brought up where I was like, as cool as it was to see Killmonger again and to see Wakanda and to see Iron Man and everything, or rather Tony Stark, as cool as all that was, the zombie one is at least different enough that I was more interested in the story. Yeah, uh, because this really <laughs> Killmonger is so I, I think that's the problem is is in Killmonger himself and choosing him to be a what if because Killmonger is a character who is so 100% focused on what he wants. Literally, his whole life is spent training to get to that point where he can throw T'Challa off a waterfall. Like he is so driven to get to that, that really that guy can't diverge if you if his life depended on it. That guy right. cannot take a different path. That's just not who he is. I think the more interesting what if story for him would have been what if T'Chaka didn't do that and get his father killed? And what if Killmonger grew up to be a normal kid and then lived a perfectly normal, happy life and got married and had a family. And then as like a 35 year old man with a little daughter, he finds out, oh, my cousin is the king of an African nation. I, I feel like that's a way more interesting story that we could have heard because then now here's this guy who's not an evil psychopath, who's a totally nice, normal, absolutely pleasant human being. And he finds out this news and it rocks his world and turns everything upside down. I would have loved to see that story. Yeah. I mean, here's the other thing, right? If Killmonger's values were in creating is essentially like using the the means and resources to give everyone the opportunity, you know what I mean? Like to, to build, to help, to help his people. Um, when he was, when he was, uh, when he was hired by Tony Stark, why didn't he just build, why didn't they just build Iron Man armors for everybody? You know what I mean? Like, like I know Tony wouldn't want it in the wrong hands, but if Killmonger, if he looked up to Killmonger as much as he did as as a soldier, um, then why didn't he be like, okay, why don't we start making repulse? Like, like why didn't he start handing out Star Tech in a different way? You know what I mean? Like using those, re- like to just kill him and just like, and then go to Wakanda and kill that, like essentially kill, you know. Uh, do the whole thing with killing them and all that stuff. Like it just made it like him taking over Wakanda. It just made no sense. Like he had, he literally could have essentially aligned Stark uh, up to the, actually. Yeah. 
he could have aligned Stark to get him on board with the whole vibranium thing and then convince the Wakandans to trust him as well and then be the outlet of Star Tech and Vibranium. He could have literally been the peak of it all. Yeah. And he's just like, I'm gonna, I have to kill Tony Stark in order to take that power. I have to kill the, uh, like, well, not kill Wakandans, but I have to convince the Wakandans that I should run the whole thing. And then, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take over the world kind of thing. Where, it, where it's literally he could have used his powers to convince everybody. And then he would have had the same result. Yeah, there's a lot of different roads this could have taken, and I don't think they picked the most interesting one. Uh, and it's funny, I was trying to remember before we before I set up and we started recording, I was trying to remember how this episode ends, and I couldn't. What happened at the very end? I, I, I my memory is taking me up to he turns the robots oh, back on, and then he I remember what happens. What happens? So. Um... Oh man! Oh God! What's her name? Uh, it ends with Pepper Potts meeting with uh, T'Challa's sister, right? And she yeah. says, "Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you take this guy down because I know he's bad news." Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, it it really just kind of squeaks out into something that's too similar to Iron Man and too similar to Black Panther to really feel like a what if mm -hmm. at the end of the day it is yeah, like, very safe and and i mean i've seen what if comics were like the avengers were in medieval times like that to me like that's mm. that's a concept right like what if the avengers had to time travel and solve like something in medieval times what would they look like how would they fight um and i i vividly remember like images of Iron Man as a as a knight, and to me, like already those concepts, like it, it almost would be kind of an Army of Darkness moment with Tony Stark being in medieval times, because you would have to come up with all these like crazy inventive ways to like essentially recreate Iron Man, which is fun. Like that that to me is cool, and then like Cap would essentially like be like um be the symbol of like moving forward you know what i mean like pro like be the symbol of progress essentially in medieval times like all these little things that to me is like a what if like what if, like that kind of thing whereas these all these are just kind of off plays of the movie and the concept at first is great but going back to what i said in a previous podcast it kind of feels like the the where's the, the why is the rum always gone joke just yeah kind of like that constant constant joke and it's, it's played its course and it's like okay let's get let's get weird like let's do something cool well they are constantly putting christine everhart back front and center so they did i yeah. saw it you know i was gonna text you too i was like oh man they put her back in get back but it's not she's not an eyeless no an eyeless well they gotta build up to that right they're showing no. her it's it's like uh, it's like we got to see Rhodey for a little bit before he puts on the war machine armor, right? So they wanted to remind us she exists, so that when Avengers Five Annihilation comes out and she's like, "Behold," uh, then we oh, can. Yeah, because uh, uh, I was actually thinking the other day. I was thinking of like, you know, big the big villains of Marvel, like your Thanos yeah. and now your King the Conquerors or whatever. And I was thinking does Marvel have a villain that the MCU could use as like a big villain who's the villain of a whole saga, not just one phase? Do they have a villain who fits that mold who's a female character? And I was thinking and thinking, I couldn't think of one. And I was like, well, we can always just make Christine Everhart a Nile. Let's go <laughs> over there. So you're welcome. I mean, uh, yeah, there are, there's a couple they could do uh, that could be carried on through. Um, the trick is, is they kind of used one of them. Enchantress? In a Fox movie. Well, in a Fox movie? Yeah, and, and Tran Enchantress would have been one. Um, the, the Fox movie, they used Madame Hydra, and she would have been perfect solid villain to like carry through which is that the the old captain america movies which which movie are you talking about first of all how dare you sir how dare you <laughs> slander captain america movies with a fox name i'm talking about x-men 
X Men. Okay, when did they Wolverine. use Madame? In in the Wolverine movie, the first no, or sorry, the one in Japan, they used uh, Madame Hydra. They did. Wow. They did. Are you talking about the blonde lady? Yep. Are you sure that was Madame Hydra? I thought her name was like Venom or, or not not Venom, but like Poison Poison Snake. It, it was some like snaky thing. Exactly. <laughs> She's a snake. <laughs> she clearly was not a memorable character. Um, clearly, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. It, uh, it's it, yeah. She, I'm pretty sure she was. Uh, uh, where's it's not it's not Logan, is it? No, Logan was the old one. No, you're thinking of the Wolverine. The Wolverine, yeah. Oh, yeah. These, these naming conventions. Oh yes. Sorry, I was I was wrong. It's not Madame Hydra. Madame Viper. Madame Viper. Is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is again that same villain. It's I'm still thinking of the sort of the same villain. Actually, mm-hmm. there's a Madame Hydra. She's slightly a little more intense. But yes, Madame Viper is another perfect example. Leader of the Serpent Society, Ooh. and and could have been a great character to carry through, but they didn't. But do, do, you, that. do you think that character is like? a Thanos or Kang level villain? Because that's the kind of villain I'm I'm looking for here. Is there a Thanos or Kang level female villain in Marvel? And if not, how would you feel about them maybe making like Doctor Doom a lady or something? Mm. Well, first of all, Fantastic Four is not in a position to make that kind of character change. I don't think that I, I just, as much as I'd love to see a lady Doctor Doom, I think Fantastic Four. I think Fantastic Four needs to stay play it safe with the comic source material. I think, mm-hmm. like, especially if you're going to do Doctor Doom, Doctor Doom has had a fun run, uh, both both not getting it quite right and then trying to do something completely different that just doesn't work. Um, and yeah. Yeah, just just nah, just nah. <laughs> just nah. Uh, but I mean, is there a Marvel female villain? I'm gonna have to think on that. I mean, technically, Electra would be probably the uh, per- perfect. Electra? Yeah, yeah, Electra would be a perfect kind of much larger character. You know what I mean? I mean, Hela would have been a good one you could have done for a while. Yeah, Hela is. Pardon the pun, hella more powerful than Electra. Ah. Uh, eh. But um, I think I think this is a uh, something that will be that we will be touching on more in October mm-hmm. when we do our mm-hmm. special episode uh, that's going to have to do with villains. Mm-hmm. So everybody, stay tuned for that because that one's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so let me run this question by you then, Ryan. Okay. In yeah. a week. Less than a week, I should say. We will be getting a Star Wars animated show. We'll be getting Star Wars Visions, the anime show. Uh, That will be all canon, as far as I can tell. It won't be what if. It'll it'll all take place within canon, I think. Mm -hmm. So, what do you? If Marvel made a show along the lines of Visions, and I know it's not out yet, so. We can't really be at the risk of being presumptuous here. If Marvel made a show along the lines of Visions where everything was canon with the MCU, A, is that something you'd want to see? And B, what could they possibly do that you wouldn't rather just see in a live action movie? (laughs) All right. So... I think uh, it's tricky, huh? Well, what I would like to see is again. I mean, X Men cartoon is on. Like, you don't need to revisit it. You don't need to. No. You don't need to remaster it. You don't need to redo the whole thing. And there are some great stories in there. What I would like to see. What I would like to see, though, and I guess the best way to describe it is like there are stories that I would love them to do, 
and it doesn't have to be complicated at all. Essentially, you take a story series like The Age of Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. I would love to see The Age of Apocalypse. And, and, and they should just do a hour long cartoon with a different animation company of the entire run of age of apocalypse. Ah, and okay. then, and then the same goes for like, uh, the same goes for maximum carnage, because to be fair, we only got to see a weird 90 Spider-Man cartoon. I'd say a uh, two or three parter, uh carnage episode but it wasn't like maximum carnage it was just carnage was in it and it was cassidy mm -hmm. and like they only i think they only did like two or three scenes that were relatively close to the comics like somewhat close but the rest of it was like far off but perfect example just literally bring the comic to life the, like animate it find an animation comp you know what that company that did dc's animated stuff the young justice cartoon hire that company to do it and just have them recreate specific comic stories. They don't need some overarching cartoon, like some, some overarching storyline that includes comic book stories, literally just do the story from, from start to finish within an hour long, do that. Do exactly. You know what? Exactly. Like DC animated movies did. Bruce Tim mm -hmm. is a genius. That guy, I could just like, just, I can, if that was a university course, I would get honor roll student status because that guy is, is probably the best at transforming comic book stories to animated experiences. And the best example is all those movies are perfect. They're all adaptations of comic book stories. Justice League Doom, Batman Under the Red Hood. All those movies are all comic book stories and they're graphic novels and their whole thing. And all he does is just adapt them and throw them. And it doesn't have to be that hard. If Marvel did the exact same formula and had the same kind of creative mind as Bruce Tim, then the Marvel animated side would be as strong as Bruce Tim's DC side. Because in essence, uh, when I talk to my friends, uh, my 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 friends outside of you, um, they all the DC fans they all say the same thing: DC movies obviously you got your your batmans and those movies are incredible uh, man of steel can be debated but here's the thing you cannot argue mcu as a whole you can you can pick apart certain movies but you can't argue mcu as a whole whereas if you were to compare it to dc you could pick apart dc like crazy because it's just nothing's cohesive everything's their own separate things right and but when it comes to the animated animated department, the only thing Marvel has, in my opinion, you could easily argue with me all day long. But if you were to look at like really solid long story arcs, you got an X Men cartoon, you have your Spider Man '90s cartoon. I will gladly debate why that's a good cartoon, and you also have Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Those three cartoons, out of massive like many many cartoons uh that marvel has published those three are like timeless like you you could go back and watch them anytime bruce tim side of the world of dc you got batman you got you know superman you got batman beyond you got justice league you got justice league unlimited you got young justice you have all these cartoons plus the movies and they're all solid they're all timeless they're all fantastic so you would want this Marvel cartoon to not worry about MCU canon to just be completely a separate thing. I personally, I, if yeah, I honestly think I would, because mm -hmm. here's the deal. I, I like where I like the MCU's head right now in terms of like, okay, yeah, let's do some multidimensional stuff. But to me, if you're going to do multidimensional stuff, then like, again, boldly go where we haven't gone before. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the point. That's my point about what if. Boldly go where we haven't gone before. And what are we doing right now? We're going exactly where we've been. And that's where we don't want to go. We don't want to go where we've been. We want to go places we haven't been yet. And that's what makes Marvel MCU special. Is because everything that happens in the... You unlocked it, sir. You unlocked <laughs> it. Everything that happens in the MCU affects everything else. And that's right. what makes it fascinating, right? If you, you could watch different movies here and there out of sequence 
but you'll notice things are different mm -hmm. and you'll notice certain things have changed and and yeah like and what will happen is is like uh like thor thor dark world small end credit sequence but if you go see the the collector and the guardians you know there's more to that story and something's changed whereas what if it just kind of feels like okay it happened but nothing's changed it that's a different dimension and that's yeah. why I think when when you had that moment at the end of the podcast where you're like, oh yeah, it's it's um, it's one of those things where uh, sorry, it's one of those things where um, you know if if Uatu is like, okay, what if I intervened? But that's not going to affect anything. But it does. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. or like he hopes it doesn't. But we know. But we know something's going to affect. Those events are going to affect something in the MCU. Now, of course, the interesting thing is, is like at the end of the whole thing, the end of the whole what if, they could do something like a small scene that's going to affect the entire MCU. But to me, I don't know. Like it just, I, I feel like that's kind of like, eh, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to make me go, okay, that one scene is going to be unforgettable and it's going to be a huge game changing moment, but I'll easily forget the whole show. Whereas like Loki, I, I, I can't stop thinking about what happened to Loki. Like all the right. the things that not only transform the character, but transforms the event and the timeline. And like those last, even that last episode, the entire episode, which is like 40-ish minutes, 50 maybe, um, there's so many things that change the timeline and like can affect everything. It makes you think about the whole thing. But yeah, in terms of your question with the Star Wars Visions, I think for me, if you're gonna do animated stuff, do do stories, do or or each or if you're gonna do a Star Wars Vision thing, focus on a character. And each episode focus on a different character that we haven't seen, like Cable or like uh, Spider Man 2099. Like focus on these random characters, but at some point they'll eventually maybe cross paths with somebody else. Heck, do Squirrel Girl. I don't even like Squirrel Girl, but do Squirrel Girl. Yeah, Squirrel Girl is the best. Um, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm falling on the same side as you there, buddy. I think that if Marvel was to put out another cartoon, um, I don't want it to be canon with the MCU. Because the MCU, uh, everything that happens in it, I like that it happens either in a movie or now in a big Disney plus show that feels like a movie because that's the nature of the MCU is that it's taking this, this huge franchise that we have seen in books and we have seen in TV shows and we have seen in countless other things and just said, well, let's put it in movies now and let's make it the best thing can possibly be. And for them to then reverse engineer that and be like, well, now let's make it a show again. Mm, no, thank you. Because the, the, that's the reason I'm here. The reason I am here is because you decided to make the movies in the first place. Uh, you know, same with back before Infinity War came out when they were like, there's going to be a book about Thanos. I was not excited because I was like, you know what? Cool, but I don't really care about reading that because I'm just, there's 20 million books about Thanos already. I am stoked because you're about to give me a movie with Thanos and that has never happened before, except in my wildest fever dreams. So to, to compare it to Star Wars is kind of a fool's errand. And I know I'm the fool who brought it up. So that, that's me here. But like with Star Wars, Star Wars has always kind of existed in that way where it's like, it's more of a pyramid. Like here's the movies and they're the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, you see this cantina full of 20 million creatures and every creature has their own story. And you can read about those stories here. And maybe in those stories, somebody shows up and you're like, that's an interesting character. Well, you can read about her in this comic here. And it keeps branching out. Um, that is a totally different animal. And Marvel came at us from a whole other side of the coin. It came at us from comics and then shows and then this and then that. And then finally, somebody said, let's take the best parts of that, squish them together and make these really big epic movies that all connect. And that to me is the, you know, I'm sure there's comic purists out there and cartoon purists out there who will lynch me and throw me up on a crucifix for saying this. But to me, this is the purest and greatest way to uh, experience Marvel stories because they have literally cherry picked the best 
you know, they took out an amazing story like Civil War and said, this is great, but there's stuff we can remove and stuff we can add to make this the best it can possibly be and also make it fit into this world we're already inhabiting. And now you have this. And now as much as I like the Civil War comic, I love the Civil War movie 10 times more. And I am I think that they have found their their stride and to take that stride and now change the rhythm of it and say, well, now we'll have also an animated series about Okoye and what she gets up to when, you know, there's some downtime in Wakanda. It's like, I love Okoye. I would love to see more of Wakanda, but this is not a cartoon that I'm asking for. This is not a cartoon anybody's asking for. And it's really just going to dilute the property at the end of the day. So I am, if there has to be one MCU cartoon, I'm glad it's what if, even if sometimes they fumble the ball in the end zone a little bit like they did today. Uh, or rather yesterday, because we're recording this a day late. I'm sorry. I'm working Wednesdays now. Fault. That's why this came up late. It's also my fault. I'm, I'm really busy with some stuff too, guys. We're, it's, you know, it's a work season. Sometimes you got to work a lot and then, yeah. You we're not saying, always. we're not saying Ryan is Spider-Man, but we're also not saying he's not Spider-Man. But, <laughs> so. It's aliens. No, uh, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, yeah. It, and that's it. I, I, I think you nailed it. Nailed it right there. That's exactly that's exactly it. It's, and that's the thing like MCU is it's because here's the other thing though, too, that we have to get ready for with the MCU is we're going to have characters that will be crossing dimensions into the primary timeline. Mm -hmm. But how, you know, who, what, when, where, why, how, right? Like that's, yeah. that's the big question. And what if we haven't got to the point yet where I, it just doesn't seem like we're going to, it doesn't seem like we're going to get to the point where that person who is crossing dimensions will come and, or sorry, that will be introduced and, or will cross into the MCU. It just, everything's, it seems like there's, there's a fence and what if it's on one side of it and the whole MCU world's on the other side of it and the grass is always greener on the other side? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that at the end of the day, I would say it's a safe bet that Uatu is going to get involved and that's going to take place in a film or in an actual mm -hmm. canon show. And I also think that you're right uh, from a couple weeks ago when you said it, we'll probably see that Doctor Strange librarian character in a movie because he that whole him and the world of that library. Like it was too cool to not come back. Like I think yeah. all these little things will play a part. Um, but I'm not expecting anything too grand. And I think I'm happy with that, but I will throw this one crazy question at you before we mm. call it a night here. Uh, because you mentioned, you know, people hopping and how the multiverse is taking into effect and now things are going to get wild and wacky. Yeah. All right. So let me go completely bananas here because uh, i read today that there were some uh some of the early um what do you call it uh, early critical reactions to venom colon let there be carnage right uh which apparently has a runtime of 90 minutes which is i don't know how you tell a carnage story in nine like that is a short movie that is like <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's that's going to be interesting. But regardless, uh, the general consensus was that it was a decent movie, that it did Carnage justice, and you know people are happy with it. And everyone I read said that they have never heard an audience react so strongly to a post-credit scene before. Ryan, is there a chance that post credit scene involves Tom Holland and or Benedict Cumberbatch? Oh, that's a damn good <laughs> question. I didn't know. I you know I haven't I haven't heard any reviews or or any. I haven't actually surprisingly enough. I haven't seen any like comments like that. So mm -hmm. I think they just came out today. Like this is fresh. So fresh off the press. It's 
It's possible, because here's the thing. We've already seen in the trailer for Morbius that Adrian Toomes is there, so <laughs> there is some, like, cross stuff happening. In the Spider-Man cartoon, there, when they did Carnage, there was the whole Dormammu thing. There was. You're right. He was very linked with Doctor Strange for some reason. It's very possible. I don't know. That's that. That question has a lot of weight to it. And the problem I have the part. There's part of me that's like, what? What would stop Doctor Strange and Tom Holland to come over there and be all like, "Woo, yeah!" But to what end? Why? What? Why? What's the motivation for him to find Eddie Brock in the first place? Well, I I might be just plucking the low hanging fruit here, but I think to what end is we finally get to see a good Spider Man and Venom on screen together. Yeah, but but again, yes, it's great that you want that fan service, but the issue I have with it is like, where's the story? Like, how's the story mm-hmm. work? How how do the two stories come together? Because I I remember Venom, the first one was. Your favorite movie of all time? It was all over the place. I don't know. It uh, involved rocket ships and just, uh, oh, man, science facility and all this whole nine yards. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's very possible. You're not wrong. I, I mean, Spider Tom Holland meeting Eddie Brock for the first time would be epic. Um, we don't know what that spell is going to do in No Way Home. We don't know what's going to happen. Are they in a different dimension? Have no idea. The other thing is, like, even Doc Ock, is that the Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2? Or is it just a coincidence that they casted the same guy and he became Doc Ock in the events that happened in No Way Home? Right. I don't know. I don't know. As a fan, what I want to see, if that reaction is as big as you're saying, and I think this is why you're asking me, as a fan, what I'd like to see is the Daily Bugle is have Eddie Brock apply for the position at the Daily Bugle and Tom Holland's applying as well. Ooh. That's the only thing, yeah. the only thing I can come up with that would put all the chess pieces in the right places. You know what, dude? I really like that. I really like, imagine it's, it's you know, I can just see the cinematography now here. There's a medium shot of Eddie Brock and he's like, I'm, I'm trying to do the, the accent Tom Hardy does because it's ridiculous. Uh, I'm a reporter. I just, I just want to come over here and, uh, and apply for this job. And then reverse shot, and it's J.K. Simmons sitting in the desk. And already people go nuts. right? Already people are like, ah! Oh. And he's like, ah, oh, I like you, kid. You're hired. Well, maybe you're hired. Uh, maybe I'll freelance you. But uh, you're the second applicant I've gotten today. Uh, and then like it, we cut to a wide shot. And there's Peter just standing next to Eddie. He's like, hey, how's it going? And that's where we cut. Exactly. I, and that's, that's exactly it. Like, that's how I would picture it. I would even do, like, Holland walks out as Hardy walks in. And, mm. you know, and, and uh, Hardy comes in to say, as you see Holland leave. And, um, and Hardy goes, oh, I, you know, I, I got video footage of Spider-Man that you'll want to see. Or something like that, right? Right. And then Holland, Holland, or, or J.K. Simmons goes, "Oh, you, you know the, that just the kid that just came in already offered me a story. What do you got?" And then uh, kick it off that way, something like that, something along those lines. And then the symbiote's like, "Eddie, let's eat that boy." So, and- that, that's a stupid <laughs> thing. I don't get. I mean, it could be a comic book thing, but I don't ever remember venom in the comics being like i'm gonna eat this person i know he said he would bite them because he's poisonous but mm-hmm. i don't remember him ever ever actually saying he's gonna eat somebody he's a cannibal i don't know, know. he's gotta he's like, gotta feed somehow remember all that they, raw nasty chicken that he made eddie brock eat in the first movie and then he puked that but that makes sense to me like that's that's kind of funny but yeah. the whole person it kind of breaks the reality for me of like the character <laughs> but here's the thing is what i will say about venom is that 
it kind of feels like this is a millennial version of Venom, and that's what bothers me about it. Millennial? I, I don't know how else... Yeah, like, it just feels... Again, I, I think the problem is it just feels like, oh, we need Venom. We need Venom. And it's like, you don't need Venom. You want Venom because everyone knows who Venom is. You mm-hmm. don't need him yet. You have no... you Again, my biggest problem is, is like you haven't even introduced enough... Like, you, you kind of shoehorned him in when you could have like really built him out. You know what I mean? Like, the movie... The, one thing I did like about Venom, the movie, was like I love seeing him as a failed... Or a kind of like a uh, the off brandish YouTube kind of reporter, you know, like the realist yeah. reporter thing. Like I thought that was cool, but again, like I don't know, like to give him a like a standalone movie without Spider Man, like why couldn't you work towards some way of trying to get them to meet? Because at the, I think when Venom happened, Marvel had Spider Man. Like Marvel was making or in the process of making a Spider Man film. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But if I'm right, then my goal would be like, okay, if we want to do a villain's approach, why not do these stories about, you know, crime taking over New York under Spider-Man's radar? Something like that. I don't know. Something like that. And like, like here, for example, is like, because Sony has the rights to Spider-Man, if I were to play it smart, here's how I would have done the first movie. The first movie, I would have had Eddie Brock as the reporter, as we know and see. But he does reports of the stories of the villains that we're going to see in future Spider-Man films. So, for example, the first Venom movie would have been him reporting Connors and the story about Connors becoming the lizard. And he comes up with all these, like, he's, like, like, you know, stalking them, essentially, and learning that, oh, you know, it's whatever, it's the lizard. And he goes down... And he goes to like see where the lizard is and what he's trying to do, and then um, like it's it's kind of like a it's done in a horror movie sense where like the the massive thrill in the end is him seeing the lizard and being like this beast and he's trying to like outrun him all this stuff, and then Spider Man comes in, whips him up. You don't even have to have him like you could if if Holland was as, as big a success as it is, you don't even Holland's like a cameo thing like the big fight is him and lizard at the end and he's making the quips in the oh hey i'm gonna get you uh you're a lizard Meh. and like webs him up and... oh my god tom holland is that you <laughs> yeah and uh and then he webs him up and then that's it and then in the end it's like oh yeah i got the story on the lizard and it's kurt connors and he goes and then the, the punchline is it's kurt connors yeah yeah well, they're, and then they're the, existing the movie, simultaneously yeah like the mm-hmm. second movie is is kind of the same formula, but you do a little bit more, right? Like then then you do you know you could easily do the story of um, Doc Ock, perfect example. Doc Ock, the story about his 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 uh, his journey to get like self sustaining fusion energy, and have it go horribly wrong, take people kidnapped, and Eddie Brock, and then Eddie Brock tries to intervene and tries to stop him this time around. Then in the end, Spider Man comes in webs him up and then he starts to get angry and then the second movie i would have tom holland and him go to the bugle and try to fight for like the story of (laughs) spider-man then the third movie venom comes in boom there's your there's your venom story thank you're welcome sony thank you for uh hiring me to consult for your movies all i ask is that when we finally see venom and spidey on screen together please put spider-man back in the classic blue and red costume from homecoming this black and red business is not doing it for me at all. Uh, and you lose all the contrast between Venom and Spider-Man if you keep him in the black and red. There's no good reason to keep him in the black and red. Uh, well, well, that is Venom and What If, episode six. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting last few weeks, I think, for this show. Yes. And, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they round out the last few episodes. Ryan. Where can the people find you to write you angry hate mail about how they think their version of Venom is better and more superior than yours? And that what if is like the greatest thing that Marvel's Mm. produced. Um, You can find me, of course, on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. And of course, you can find me on Instagram at Ryan J. Whitehead. 
And you can find me on Twitter at Crusader Online. What? And also, don't forget to check out that new Hawkeye trailer. What up? Hawkeye! It's the most wonderful time of the year. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Andrew Fantasia and YouTube at Andrew Fantasia. If you're looking forward to uh, No Time to Die, James Bond 25, as much as I am, I am counting down one movie from the franchise every day until No Time to Die comes out. Right now, we are on Goldfinger, so it's still early. There's still time for you to catch up. Uh, that has been What If Episode 6. That has been Infinity Rewatch. Um, we are totally right about Venom. It's totally going to happen exactly the way we said, beat for beat, word for word. I'm, an, I'm a newspaper reporter. I'm Eddie Brock. It's going to happen like that. Well, we're going to do a whole radio play of yeah. Eddie Brock. Uh, but until that radio play happens, please have a marvelous day. I'm a reporter. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.